So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Fall Q Conference. My name is Dr. Rosana Musetti, and it's a pleasure to serve as the moderator today of our forum with the candidates who are running for State Superintendent of Public Instruction. We're gonna start off this afternoon with candidate Marshall Tuck. I'm gonna read a little bit about Marshall before we get started. Marshall Tuck believes in the power of public schools to change lives. And he spent the last 15 years working to make it happen. Most recently, Tuck worked as an educator in residence at the New Teacher Center, a nonprofit that's been working with school districts to help develop and retain effective principals and teachers in our systems. And prior to that, Tuck was the founding CEO of the nonprofit Partnership for Los Angeles Schools, a groundbreaking collaborative between the mayor's office and the Los Angeles Unified School District to operate 18 of the most struggling elementary, middle, and high schools that were serving over 15,000 schools in the district. Under Tuck's leadership, these schools raised graduation rates by more than 60% and had the highest academic improvement among California school systems with more than 10,000 students. And before joining the partnership, it's important to note that Tuck was the president of the nonprofit Green Dot Public Schools, where he helped create 10 new public charter high schools in some of Los Angeles' poorest neighborhoods. Please give a warm welcome to candidate Marshall Tuck here to the Fall Q Conference. So as we know, uh, Marshall, here uh, we have teachers, we have school administrators in the audience and also viewing us from afar. And these are folks who plan and use technology to support teaching, learning, assessment, and many of the other aspects of school, business, and operations. And we're interested this afternoon in hearing from both candidates about their vision for California schools, particularly around technology and integration and the role that it serves in closing the opportunity gap for the students in California. As you know, the state superintendent established the California Educational Technology Blueprint. This is current as superintendent Tom Torlickson. But it was only partially implemented due to funding challenges and limited fundings, which, as you know, is, a, is an issue here in California. Here at Q, we know, given that everyone is interested in technology integration, innovative teaching and learning, research consistently shows that over the past 40 years, that given sufficient professional development, along with access to digital learning tools that support curriculum and uh, access to internet at school and at home, there's a high probability that we can transform the educational outcomes for all of the students in California. So with that framing, I want to start off by asking you, why don't you tell us about your vision for California schools and what you'd like to accomplish as state superintendent? Great. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me, and, and thank you all for being here on a Saturday and a Sunday. Um, you know, I'm always inspired and optimistic about what's possible for our kids because I've worked in schools for a long time, and I'm inspired because thousands and thousands of kids that I work with always show that when we step up for them, they always, always soar. And I'm also inspired because I get to work with phenomenal educators like you all. And I always remind people, what profession would you find so many people on a Saturday and a Sunday come to work to get better at their jobs? Right? There's, there's nothing like it. Uh, and, and that's why it's just so fun to be here today to see all of you. Additional time because you care about our kids. And thank you for doing that and thank you for having me. And when I think about vision for California public schools, it starts with what it should be a quality public school for every single child in every neighborhood in this entire state. Like that's, that's what our vision has to be and that's what we know is possible. And, and we know it because we've done the work and you know, I'm a big believer in the promise of public schools. And for me, a lot is personal. My grandma was a public school teacher. My mom was a public school teacher. I went to public schools. I've worked in public schools for almost 16 years. My son Mason, who's seven, goes to our local public school in Los Angeles. But ultimately that belief in public schools is about that underlying concept that regardless of who you are, what, what your background is, where you come from, if you have access to quality public education, you have a chance to be the person you wanna be. Like that's the beauty of it. Um, but the reality is in spite of how important public schools are, in spite of how hard our educators are working, this state has not prioritized public education for decades. And that's, that's one of the reasons we're all having such a hard time doing our jobs. 1977, we were seventh in funding per student in the country. We're 41st today. 
That's a political decision that's been made by elected leaders not to prioritize our public schools. Also, over the last 40 years, we've created the California Education Code, which has literally went from one volume to now being about 15 volumes and eight point font that takes a lot of innovation and creativity out of our classrooms. And we just under supported our educators along the way. So we, we need fundamental real change in our public schools and it has to start with the elected leadership in Sacramento because that leadership has not gotten the job done. And I always remind people when people, you know, a lot of, I, I'm up and down the state all the time and folks talk about public schools and oftentimes people will say, well, they blame our educators for what's going on in sure. our public schools. And I remind them, teachers didn't underfund their classrooms and principals certainly didn't smother their schools in red tape. Like those are political decisions made by politicians. And our focus is we need to bring real change to our public schools. We have to fund them the way that our kids deserve. We need to get serious about supporting our teachers and principals, move our schools into the 21st century and truly serve all kids. And we got a comprehensive plan and we can dig into any of those areas, but the foundation of it all has to be our kids are phenomenal and the adults are working hard, but our elected leaders are not getting the job done, which is why we need an educator um, to be in this position and not, not another politician. That's great. We can really appreciate, I think, as teachers and administrators in the room, uh, the vision and this idea of we should work from a principle that our students are all phenomenal and have extraordinary potential. Could you maybe identify what would be your first couple of concrete steps to uh, disrupt what you've described sort of as the bureaucracy potentially of public schools and also the funding conundrum that you've uh, laid out for us? What, what are some concrete first steps that you would take with this potential position on the horizon? Yeah, absolutely. We think of like four key fundamental areas to focus on as a state. Heavy investment in teachers and principals and counselors, move our schools to the 21st century, fully fund our public schools and, and truly serve all kids. Like, and there's a bunch underneath that that would take us you know, three hours versus 30 minutes to talk through. But a couple specifics, you know, one is we have a massive teacher shortage in the state of California right now, uh, particularly in math, science, special ed. And, and frankly, our low income communities have had teacher shortages for decades, this is not new. Um, and we have to shift this inequity where low income kids have more substitutes, uh, more teachers that aren't credentialed and, and more open positions. So I think in the sh long term, we have to pay educators more. You can't, in many parts of the state, you can't be a teacher and buy a house and that doesn't make sense. Um, short term, I think we should do free college. If you commit to teach for five years or more, you can do that. It's a couple hundred million dollars on the current budget, very doable given that it's a $90 billion total budget uh, with the current dollars. And I think that's a way to at least get more young people to come in the profession while in parallel, we have to really, I think, restructure our teacher training programs. Um, you know, this, this whole conference, right, it's all about like, how do we leverage technology and bring our schools in the 21st century? And yet, if you really look at a lot of our teacher training programs, we're just not really thinking about how do we leverage technology in our classrooms in a different way in terms of what we teach our new teachers. We're not doing enough time on cultural competency of our student population, given that so many of our folks that go into teaching aren't coming from the neighborhoods where a lot of our kids are coming from. So deep investment in teachers and principals. And secondly is, we gotta move our schools in the 21st century. Um, as I mentioned, my son Mason, he's seven. I dropped him off at, in first grade in LA at our local public school a couple days ago. And his first grade classroom looks an awful lot like my first grade classroom 39 years ago. Like he, he, he goes in, he walks, he sits down on the reading rug, and I sat down on the reading rug, you know? And then he, he, he get the agenda on the board, and it's a whiteboard, not a blackboard, but it's pretty similar. And he's, he's going off of worksheets, and I'm like, I, I had worksheets 39 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it just, think about how much the world has changed in the last 40 years, but how little some, not all, but some of our classrooms have changed. And I think a lot of that gets back to the California Education Code. That's right. And we've taken creativity and innovation out of the hands of our educators and, and replaced it with a lot of rules from Sacramento. And so what I wanna move towards is we gotta give much more flexibility locally. And what I'd like to do is work with school districts up and down the state to go and get a waiver from the education code and give school districts a lot more flexibility from the ed code to try different things, be much more creative and, and push innovation and creativity back in the hands of teachers and principals and counselors rather than having be so many different constraints. And then underline all that, we certainly have to increase funding. Uh, we're 41st in the nation. One of the reasons you mentioned briefly, I, you know, I led a group called the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools, which was essentially a turnaround district public schools, district public schools in LA, where the mayor and the school district said, let's all work together on turning around the lowest performing schools in LA. We, graduation rates were 36% when we started working there in 2008, they're 81% today, and we had the highest improvement on state tests. One of the reasons we were successful, we raised $100 million 
about 800 bucks more per kid annually to help support our schools. And that allowed us to pay principals more to work in Watts in East LA and South LA. Allowed us to have a lot more principal, I mean, teacher professional development. We had a summer institute over the summer. When we think about technology, when we brought technology to our schools, we actually did tons of PD with teachers and principals and administrators on how to utilize that. We got our parents more involved, launched a parent college on Saturdays. And these are kind of things that you all know how much more you could do in your schools if you had more funding, more flexibility. Specifically, what we need to do is we got to increase funding. There's some current areas of the budget today that we can move over. Um, one, prisons. We are the highest state in terms of spending per prisoner in the country, and we're 41st in public schools. And we've been talking for a long time. Let's get serious about moving that money over. Um, on the campaign trail, we had an advertisement that said, we, we, as a state, we spend $71,000 per prisoner and only $16,000 per student. We showed a video on that, and a week later, the prison guards put a million bucks in this campaign for my opponent and against me, just to give you a sense of how, how special interests work uh, in this state. Um, and so, but, but we can move money there. Another source of money besides just cutting the prison dollars is um, online sales tax. Uh, state, the Supreme Court just said it's got to be collected. That's $1.2 billion of new revenue that's coming to California. Let's fight for all that to get to California, I mean, to public schools within this state. And then lastly, we've, we've got to move forward on, particularly, I think, with Prop 13 on the corporate side of things. If you do all those things, you can actually see, you know, six, seven billion dollars additional go into education in the next couple of years. That's not where we need to get to. Really long term, you need about 20 billion more, but that's a good start. But do more innovation and, and drive different change for our kids. And they deserve nothing less, and, and you all deserve nothing less. But underneath all of it, it requires a different kind of leadership, because the same leadership for the last couple of decades, it's not getting the job done you know, for our kids or for our teachers, and we gotta shift that. So thank you for identifying that money matters. Um, my, it matters my next, a lot. <laughs> it, it sure does. And, and as we know, and as you've art clearly articulated, um, California public schools are underfunded, and all too often, superintendents like myself, local, uh, teachers um, at the classroom level, principals at the school level, find themselves having to make choices. Do we get technology integrated this year? Or do we compensate our teachers? Do we uh, keep our after school program or do we expand our media center? And we have tough choices uh, to make because the bottom line is funding's lacking. So you've described really well um, some concrete plans as to how we could shift some of the funding back to um, education and a focus so that we're no longer 41 and closer to the top 10. Um, I'm wondering, um, could you specifically talk a little bit, especially given the nature of the educators in front of us at, at the Q conference here, um, how do you see scaling large-scale professional development and technical support for technology integration in our schools, knowing that they've got dilapidated infrastructure, a, a non-one-to-one device reality? Um, how would you um, plan to scale high-quality professional development and technical support so that technology integration is just how we do business in California public schools, no matter what the zip code is. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe I'll share for a, a little bit some of the stuff we did in the schools I led, and then how do you then scale that and think about that statewide. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the partnership schools, we, we doubled graduation rates, dramatically decreased suspensions, substantially increased performance uh, on all metrics, and, and technology was a huge investment of ours. And mm -hmm. we both leveraged additional philanthropic dollars, so we raised some more money to get both devices in the hands of teachers and principals and kids, because a lot of our schools, schools are in Watts, South LA, East LA, we just didn't have a lot of devices at all. Secondly, the schools, maybe they had broadband coming in, but as many of you know, we were just old buildings where the wireless was brutal when we first got there, we had to put additional investment into the infrastructure, and then, and then the key part, as you all know, because you live it, but, but sometimes folks miss, if you don't have the professional development that combines with it, it just doesn't matter, and it's not just for the teachers. Too often, we actually don't give the PD to the principals, to the directors, to the superintendents, because when you move to technology, you gotta have the whole system actually aligned with that technology, rather than just assuming, oh, let's just give it to the teacher and they're on their own, in terms of thinking about how to leverage it. And so, you know, we, we take, you know, Ritter, Ritter Elementary School is a school in, in Watts that we took over with the lo second lowest performing elementary school, and we brought in ST Math, you know, which was a spatial, temporal math, uh, spatial temporal math, really good math program, and we've had that in. We did summer training for the teachers at that school. We found our most effective teachers, something we did at, at New Teacher Center as well, is, and had them, give them a little more time in the master schedule mm -hmm. to coach and mentor their peers, and then not surprisingly, then, then the teachers were learning from each other, just like you're all doing here, and we tried to build that in um, both to the school day as well as weekends and additional, and that school had significant success in improving math results, and not surprisingly, our other schools were like, well, 
we want to do more of that and, and build it up. And so at the state level, I think one, we have some infrastructure issues. So we still have, particularly in our rural communities, how many, I don't know how many folks here work in rural communities, um, but, but we got real problems with technology because there's certain communities that literally still don't even have quality broadband and we have to differentiate funding where it's gonna cost more to get technology access to our rural communities and the state has to pay for that. Mm -hmm. I think we should think about bonds, both for technology infrastructure, not necessarily for software, but for all of the, to make sure every single school fully piped with broadband, fully wireless within the school site and has the devices necessary. I think that's a thoughtful way, not just for local bonds, which has been the, the key, but also for state bonds. And then you have to leverage the state and the counties and partners like CUE to do the professional development. And this is something that we talked briefly about ahead of time, which is there are phenomenal partner organizations that are experts at building capacity. So the state should be leveraging them to be capacity builders across districts and it oftentimes to help build the capacity at the county level. So I think a real investment in just overall broadband infrastructure with a priority in rural, which has been left behind the most, real focus on professional development and leveraging partners to do so is I think where the state can really move forward on technology. Underlying all that is sharing best practices. Our state has a really broken data system in California. Um, we're one of only six states in the country. Technology capital of the world is California. We're one of the six states in the country that does not have a pre-K through 16 data system to really help us see what's working in schools. And so I think what you wanna have is strong data coming in. What we all know is you'll see districts that are utilizing in schools technology more are gonna have more success with students. Then you leverage that data to then go push in to build the capacity in districts that aren't getting the job done. I think to get this done, you really have to think about a state superintendent who's actually done the work in the field, led school systems to help move these strategies forward. This position, which is state superintendent of public instruction for the last 25 years has been held by a member of the legislature who then moved into this job, not necessarily people who have led education systems. Great, so thanks for describing your concrete experience around some of those large scale efforts in the spaces that you've worked. Um, you also, in your response, identified the importance, right, at the local level, there being alignment in order to uh, maximize optimal results at the classroom level where our kids live every day, that it's important to have alignment from superintendent Absolutely. down to middle management within a school district, down to a principal, a building leader, and then, of course, uh, the teacher in the classroom so that they have all the support necessary to maximize technology opportunities in the classroom. Um, at the state level, um, I believe that that alignment is also necessary. So could you describe how you would work with the governor, the California legislator, the California State Board of Education, right, uh, to establish and support implementation of these various priorities you've described, the policies that could support implementation, and plans that we need in place to actually close the digital divide and technology gap in all of our schools up and down the state? Absolutely. I mean. California should have the best public schools in the country. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lifetime Californian. This, this state's the wealthiest state in the nation. Uh, we just have incredible kids in the state, and yet we have some of the lower performing public schools. And, and for us to get from where we are to the best, you really need the governor, legislature, state superintendent, business community, and labor all working together and saying, I believe that public education needs to be the top policy priority in the state of California for the next decade. This state has prioritized other policies, a lot of them just not public schools, not our kids. So, so that, that just has to be the starting point. Um, I believe the next governor will be Lieutenant Governor Newsom. I have a strong pre-existing relationship with him. Uh, and I think if you look, what's nice, if you look at his plans, he's very focused on how do you leverage technology in, in particular as a way to really move the needle on schools. Um, I'm not in the legislature, but actually we have over a dozen members of the legislature who've endorsed our campaign. So I start there with a lot of pre-existing relationships. And what's nice is my experience, particularly at the partnership, the partnership for LA schools was a brand new school, kind of a school district within LA Unified. There's like a local district within LA Unified, 15,000 kids, 18 schools. It was the mayor, it was the school district. We actually leveraged the county because we put some health clinics on some of our campuses. We leveraged tons of nonprofit partners and I led that effort. So the experience of actually working across agencies and across kind of political dynamics to implement the work, not to talk about it or pass policy, but to actually implement the work, which is what the state superintendent needs to do in terms of the glue, like I've done that at a smaller scale and that's where we, we wanna do that across the entire state. And, and as you all know, oftentimes in education, there's, there's a lot of speeches and there's a lot of policy, but, but it's, it's an implementation. It's, it's, it's at the school level and the school district level, we gotta understand the trade-offs on the implementation and how to get these different agencies not to all have their own agenda, but have an agenda which says kids first, 
teacher second, like principal third. Like I, our, our model was always as many supports and decisions, classroom, school, school district, state. And, and too often it's the other way around. It's like state priorities, then it's like district, then school, then classroom. We, we gotta shift that entirely and, and we have to have all those agencies behind it. Okay, that's great. So with uh, speaking about sort of that that's a priority at the local level, well, we know that um, in, in Governor Brown's tenure there has been a transformation, simultaneous, of course, implementation of standards, new assessment, and then, of course, um, California school funding changed. Um, local control uh, funding formula, LCFF, is driving most of the, the funding models that our school districts up and down the state are, are uh, utilizing. Can you just uh, give us your stance sort of on LCFF and how you feel that that's um, accelerated um, uh, district's capacity to be able to accomplish things on behalf of our students? Yeah, absolutely. You know, my, my career in education's all been in our low-income communities, Inglewood, South LA, East LA, Watts, a little bit of time when I was with New Teacher Center, helping out in Fresno and some other areas. And, and so I've, I've just seen the reality, which is our low-income kids require more resources to, to, to su best support them. And so I really believe that local control funding formula is probably the most important policy in education in this state for at least a decade. Um, because it said more dollars to low-income kids and English learners and foster kids, and it also said more flexibility to utilize those dollars. Challenge has been the implementation. So current stu state superintendent said that that money didn't necessarily have to go to the kids of greatest needs or to the adults who serve those kids. Um, and so I think the implementation has been a, has been a challenge. And so that's something that we're going to change right away and make sure that those dollars actually go to either directly to programs for the kids or to the adults, principals, teachers, counselors, working with the kids that the money's intended for. I think as it relates to technology, like all of us here in this room really believe in, and we know it because we've lived it, that leveraging technology can be just a huge asset to help improve student learning. And I think as you move to an LCFF world where there's less categoricals, the need for all of us to show the impact of technology to other schools and school districts that aren't necessarily utilizing it is gonna be a higher responsibility. And so I see a lot of the job at the state level is how do we get you know, a lot of the work that you all are already doing in your classrooms, in your schools, and, and make sure other schools and other teachers that aren't using technology the way you are as effectively learn from that. And that's why I think sharing best practices can be a really effective way for the state and the counties to, to lift up practices and, and, and leverage technology. One small thing we're gonna do on that front, which is you know, every year the, the state gives certificates for our teachers of the year and you know, counselors of the year and principals of the year and they usually give like a certificate and the politicians take a picture and right. that's it, right? I, I wanna give 10 grand to each person who gets those things. So if you're a new teacher or if you're just any teacher or a counselor, you know that like three or four months, and basically with that money, those, those teachers of the year have to actually do a Google Hangout three or four times a month where they share like how do they create their unit plan? When they deliver that lesson, what adjustments do they make? How do they bring technology in their classroom? At the real granular level, principal, how do we actually turn around our school so any principal or teacher can go online and see 10, 15, 20 of the best educators by subject, by, by, by district, not by district, by demographic, and how they're actually shifting practices. Mm -hmm. that, that's pretty straightforward to do at the state level. That's, we're gonna be digging into sharing best practices and technology is one key area to do that. I saw a lot of our practitioners giving a, a thumbs up to the well, 10,000. You, you do the work. Like it, 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 it's, not, it's not just the money, but like you learn best from each other, right? It's, it's stuff like this weekend. So how does the state and, and working with the counties facilitate, you know, is our school is teacher to teacher, principal to principal, counselor to counselor. That's how we learn. We don't necessarily support that the way we need to at the state level, and we're going to change that. Great. So we have some questions. Thanks for answering mine. We have some questions from uh, the members of the audience that were submitted as they walked in today. So uh, someone from the audience very um, appropriately identified that in California, 20%, over 20% of our students are learning English. How will you support our English learners? What's your stance on bilingual e um, education um, here in the state of California, given the demographic? Yeah, absolutely, and, and, and I've, as I mentioned, my work's mostly been in LA, and so as you can imagine, LA is vast majority Latino, uh, over 30% English learners and, and a lot of new immigrants, so that's been my work for a long time. Um, Systematic change is what's needed for English learners. It starts with pre-K for all. The fact is most of our English learners are coming in behind. Um, this state in the last seven years has increased funding for prisons by $800 million, even though, we are our, even though our number of prisoners is going down. That's a political decision. If that money had been used for pre-K, you pay for pre-K for all. Like that, that, that's where you have to shift. And, and, and again, that's an area where um, you know, my opponent in this race actually voted for those increases and, and the prison union guard is, are strongly against us. Um, but you gotta go pre-K for all. Secondly is teachers. Our English learners too often actually have 
teachers that actually aren't credentialed. You look, at, look at the data, not enough credentialed teachers, experience, they have less experienced teachers and more turnover. So we gotta get serious about how do you actually ensure you have strong instructors for English learners. Third is time. A lot of time, in our schools, you mentioned the trade-offs. The, the challenge if you're an English learner, you all know, especially early on, is you're learning a core subject and a language. That can oftentimes take more time. So in our schools, we often do a zero period and seven period to actually give more time so that if you're, if you're not actually losing out on one or the other. Mm -hmm. And then bilingual, I'm a strong supporter of. Um, we got some real issues on, we need incentives to get more people to teach bilingual, because we're actually, as, we're, as the demand in a good way is growing and systems are getting more serious about it, we're actually short on bilingual teachers. And so, like most things, we gotta either start school earlier with pre-K, heavier investment in teachers and principals. Um, we talked systematically, you still gotta also, when you think about that training, you gotta get back to the principals and the directors and the superintendents because a lot of those folks aren't really up to speed on what's the most effective for English learners today. Great, thanks Marshall. Um, another question, so what's your position on public taxpayer money supporting private charter schools? And if yes, you're supportive of that movement, how do you plan to provide support to schools who, whose finances are reduced as a result of these dollars shifting to that space? Yeah, so the, the good news in California is for-profit charters are no longer allowed. So all, you know, all charters that exist today, they're, they're nonprofit organizations. The legislation was finally passed. It took way too long. I've been a vocal a, opponent of for-profit charters for a long time. Uh, nonprofit charter schools, I do believe, have a role to play in public education. Um, my rationale for that, like people have different opinions, but ultimately I remind people um, middle class and upper class families have never been stuck in a failing public school, ever. They, they can usually move to a different neighborhood for a better public schools, upper class can pay for a private school. It's only been our neediest families that have been stuck in schools like where I worked in Inglewood or, or Watts or South LA. So the idea of giving families another public school option, because it is still a public school, it's just run by a different entity, I think that's a good thing if the system is not getting the job done. Um, longer term, I talk a lot about giving districts more flexibility in the education code. The biggest difference with a charter and a district is charters have flexibility from most education code and districts do not. And I believe let's give district public schools more flexibility to be more innovative with technology, more creative in the classroom. And if you do that, you'll see less and less of a need for charters. In some communities like Oakland and LA, where there's been a large growth of charter schools, mm -hmm. I think you wanna think about more years to hold harmless for the district. So additional dollars, if they have to change that fixed cost structure on the back end, it doesn't happen in one year. So you actually maybe give like some transitional dollars for that to happen. But I do believe that nonprofit charters that are getting the job done um, have a role to play, and if they're not, if they're ineffective, by the way, the state's been very slow at shutting down bad charter schools, and so I think they're ineffective, they should be shut down much faster. Okay, great, there was a series of questions around your yeah. stance around charter schools, so uh, thank you for that response. Um, one more here, um, what do you think about state testing? How much money is spent on t state testing currently? Can we reduce the cost and the amount of testing our kids have to endure? Yeah, so where we're at these days, right, so the, the, I think we're still probably a little high on, we're high on overall testing, it's, but that's because you have state, and then you also have district, you know, kind of layered on top of that, and then you, and some years actually still have some federal. So I think at the state level, we're three through eight in 11th grade in terms of smarter balance. I, that to me, I support that, that's not a lot of time, and I think having enough data across those grade levels, what right now is three subjects, and, and you know, think about it to four, that, that to me is a good thing. It, with data, you can actually share lessons learned. I think the challenge is, is that we're not then looking at district testing, which oftentimes can get in the way of that, right? And, or the state gets in the way of district testing. So one small example is, you know, Long Beach Unified and a couple other districts wanted to get rid of the 11th grade smaller, smarter balance test and just give it the SAT or ACT to all their kids, because they do it anyway. Um, and the state wouldn't let them do that, right? And, and so now they're actually having kids prepare for both the SAT and the Smarter Balance, and they also got a bunch of AP tests. And that, that to me is, I'd say give the district the decision to, to make, if they wanna give them the flexibility to make that kind of a decision. So yeah, I that think- That was the, just vetoed. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's the problem, unfortunately. So I think that's something, hopefully, with the next governor, we can get that move forward. So I think you wanna give districts a little more flexibility, and, and you don't wanna, you wanna decrease overall testing, but I think the current system in place, three through eight with 11th is, is good as long as you give some flexibility. Okay, we have time probably for one last question from the audience. What will you do to make sure educational apps, we are here at Q, right, are following FERPA, COPPA, uh, PPRA that we use um, in classrooms? How do we make sure that, um, you know, that data is safe? Yeah, that, I think that's a good example where the state can be working with folks like CUE and, and, and taking a lead so that educators, like too often both in terms of safety, in terms of data integrity, uh, uh, integrity in terms of 
quality programs, we have way too much responsibility, like teachers, you all on your own are being very entrepreneurial and just like figuring this stuff out on your own or principals are figuring out rather than the state working with partners getting serious about one, obviously a back-end investment where um, you just shouldn't have any apps or data systems in any public schools that don't have strong security on the back end. I think that state can actually work with the providers to get serious about the requirements there. And then secondly, the state should be just kind of the central point, not dictating from the top, but working with folks in the field, which apps are getting the most usage and they're having the most success. And you can, the goodness, you can see all that data and then sharing those best practices you know, far and wide throughout the state. And that's where I think working with partners to get a sense of and how do you create a system where we can really see what are all the educators actually using in terms of the different apps, which ones are having the most success for students, and then how do we make sure that we're recommending those apps to other, other teachers so they're not having to start from scratch across all these different options that are out there. I think the security side is actually relatively straightforward to take care of. Um, I think what we gotta move forward on even more so is, is how do we take some of the work away from you all where you're having to go dig through all these different ed tech and all these different apps and at least give you almost like a Yelp type model where you can see what are the most educators actually using that's delivering the most results for kids. Great. So as we uh, consider closing here, Marshall, thank you so much for all of your responses. Why, why don't you just let the audience know your authentic why? Why do you want to be the next state superintendent of public instruction here in California? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm going to do a 30 second before the why because I just want to clarify a couple of things because there's a lot of there's a lot of misinformation that's being communicated about me um, as a person and my background, both on TV and, and through a lot of literature. So I always like to kind of clarify that with folks. Right? There's a commercial that my opponent has on the air that I'm a Wall Street banker, you know, and I worked for, I worked in finance in Los Angeles when I was 22 and 23 years old, uh, and that was it, and I've been in education for 16 years. There's also ads that I want to privatize public schools, and I'm uh, a, a private ch corporate charter guy. Um, my son goes to my local public school. I worked in public schools, district public schools for the vast majority of my career, uh, four and a half in charters, the rest in district public schools. And then there's the other one that I'm, I support President Trump and Betsy DeVos's education agenda. And with no disrespect for folks that do, uh, I'm a Democrat. I've been a strong opponent of this administration from day one. There's plenty of facts around that. I'm actually endorsed by President Obama's education secretary. Um, and, and there's just zero record. So these are, these are literally just straight lies. And I, it's unfortunate I have to take time in an audience to uh, make sure people hear the truth. But the, this, these are all, these are, these, are, these are lies you're going to hear, unfortunately, both from my opponent and from uh, his supporters. And I just encourage you to like, if you dig into the facts, those are the facts, which I told you, all backed up with fact. And, and the reason I brought it up on this question, because it comes down to, like, why are you running? Um, you know, I got an education. I, was, I worked a little bit in finance and, and technology in my early 20s. And um, I, my original plan, I was raised in a pretty faith-influenced household, so the ideals of helping other people in service were ingrained in me. And my original plan was I was to make a lot of money and then later in life go and help people. Right? I wasn't lucky enough. A lot of you knew early on when you were 18 or 16 or 21 that your passion was kids. And I was working, I'm working in finance, and my job had nothing to do with these things at 23, and I was maturing and growing up as a person, and I realized I had to do something that I cared about, that was connected to my heart and to my values, and that was about helping people have a better life. And I think like everybody in this room, I think there's nothing better that can give a child a chance at a better life in this state, in this country, than a quality public education. And so I jumped into education full time. I've done the work on the ground for almost 16 years, but during that journey, I became absolutely convinced that if we don't change the politics of education, if we don't get new leadership in Sacramento, we'll never educate all kids. And that, that if you look, what's the consistent thing around what's not working in public schools? Like, it's not our kids. Our kids are phenomenal. It's not the adults. Like, you all are working really, really hard. It's actually the fact that the elected leaders have underfunded our schools, have totally taken creativity and innovation out of your hands, have not supported teachers and principals, and the public has just kind of accepted that we're not getting the job done and made these, to your point, these impossible trade-offs that we've all had to make, especially school leaders. You know, do we offer art or more time to learn how to read because we can't do both on the current California dollar system? Like, that's a joke. Like, we have to change that fundamentally. And so this, like, we need real change if we're going to educate all kids. That's why I do this work. That's why we all do this work. It has to come from Sacramento. And we cannot keep electing the same type of politicians that we've been doing for the last 30 years that has left us where we are, which is tons of incredible kids that do not have a chance at a future right now because they're not getting the education they deserve. Tons of hardworking adults that are totally overwhelmed and under-supported because our state isn't supporting them. It's time for us to do what we, what we require, which is give every kid the education Great. they deserve. 
Great. Well, thank you for your thank time you. this yeah, afternoon, appreciate Marshall. It. We thank appreciate it. Thank you all for it. being here. Let's give him a nice round of applause. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I assume I take this off. Yeah, yeah.